Ads heard before, during, or after the podcast are not endorsed by Church of the Undead or myself unless voiced by me personally. All other ads are pre-recorded, inserted by ad agencies, and are not in my control. Hello, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome to your Daily Undead from the Church of the Undead, where I bring you into what I'm doing with my own daily Bible studies, or perhaps bring you a short message of hope and encouragement during the week outside of my normal Sunday episodes and outside of my much darker Weird Darkness podcast. Yes, it's possible to be weird, dark, and love Christ at the same time. Today, I'm bringing you an article I received in my email this morning from Crosswalk.com. It's written by Annette Griffin, and it talks about the seven broken people God used to do extraordinary works, which I thought was a great topic because so many of us believe we are so damaged from what we've done in our past, we're so broken that God would never be able to use us. Brokenness over sin is a necessary pursuit of every Christian, but the brokenness that comes through suffering, that's a different story. Bedtime prayers for our children don't include heartfelt pleas for heartache. Inspirational memes don't encourage believers to reach for shattered dreams. Even in our most sacred, intimate prayer times, it's hard to submit our will to a divine thorn in the flesh, much less request one. Yet so often, the crushing circumstances we despise and avoid are the very means by which God revolutionizes our faith, chisels away our flesh, and empowers us to do extraordinary works that reveal His glory. Nancy Lee DeMoss, in her book Brokenness, The Heart God Revives, wrote, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Contrary to what we would expect, brokenness is the pathway to blessing. There are no alternative routes. There are no shortcuts. The very thing we dread and are tempted to resist is actually the means to God's greatest blessing in our lives. Scripture and history are full of stories about real people God used to change the world, not despite their hard circumstances, but because of their hard circumstances. Here are just a few examples of how God's power was made perfect through the lives of broken people. Mary Prince. She lived from 1788 to 1833. She was born into a life of slavery in Bermuda and was sold away from her family at a young age. To break her will, her new masters physically abused her and forbade her to attend church. But at the age of 29, Mary secretly joined the Moravian church where she taught herself to read. In 1829, after learning that slavery was illegal in Britain, Mary ran away from her owners and found refuge within the Monrovian church community. With their help, Mary crafted an anti-slavery petition and presented it to Parliament, making her the first woman to do so. Parliament rejected Mary's petition, in part because of the lies told by influential slave owners, but she did not give up the fight for freedom for herself and all enslaved people. In 1831, Mary published The History of Mary Prince, an autobiography that vividly described the heartbreak, brutality, and inhumanity that she had suffered in slavery. The book sold out three times and ignited the fury of her former slave master who sued her for libel. But Mary's story also sparked an uprising of countless God-fearing individuals whose eyes had been opened to the evils of slavery. God used Mary's brokenness to bring the truth about slavery to light. Two years later, the Abolition of Slavery Act was passed by Parliament, freeing over 800,000 slaves who lived in British colonies. Then there's Corey Ten Boom, who lived from 1892 to 1983. Corey Ten Boom was born and raised in the Netherlands. She grew up in a loving Christian family who devoted their lives to serving God and others. In 1940, when Corey was 48 years old, Nazis invaded the Netherlands. Filled with an urgent desire to help the persecuted, Corey and her family provided hidden areas of their homes as a refuge to their Jewish neighbors and those in the resistance movement. Risking their lives, the Ten Boom family, in conjunction with the BJ Resistance Group, were able to help over 800 refugees escape Hitler's tyranny until Nazis raided the Ten Boom home in 1944. The family was arrested and imprisoned. Corey's father died ten days later, and she and her sister Betsy were transported to a concentration camp. 
Despite their immense suffering from illness, abuse, and starvation, Corey and her sister shared Jesus' love with whoever would listen, and many in the camp received salvation. After Betsy died in the concentration camp, a clerical error caused the guards to release Corey. One week after her liberation, all the female prisoners assigned to Corey's former camp unit were killed in the gas chambers. For the remainder of her life, Corey Ten Boom traveled the world, spreading the gospel, telling people about Jesus' unfailing love, and encouraging them to forgive their enemies. Her message carried the weight and authenticity of brokenness, and God used her testimony to bring many to Himself. George Mueller, who lived from 1805 to 1898. George Mueller is considered one of history's greatest men of faith, but he didn't earn that title during his youth. As a young man, George reveled in sin. He habitually lied, stole, and resisted authority. When he was 14 years old, his mother died, but he didn't find out until days later because of his drunkenness. Two years later, he was sentenced to jail for not paying his debts. When George was 20, he accepted a friend's invitation to attend a prayer meeting. God's Spirit touched the rebellious young man's heart at that meeting and revealed George's need for a savior. Broken over his wasted life, George fell to his knees when he got home and surrendered his life to Christ. A deep love for Jesus grew in George's heart, making it impossible to continue his reckless lifestyle. The new George desperately desired to live out his faith in service to God and others. God fulfilled his desires by calling him into ministry. In his lifetime, George cared for over 10,000 orphans, provided food, shelter, and education opportunities to children who had no one. He never accepted government funding or asked for donations. George and his staff prayed for God's provision whenever a need arose in the orphanages. God faithfully answered their prayers, sometimes in strange ways, but every cent of the millions of dollars needed to support the orphans was provided by God's loving hand. Louis Silvi Zamperini, 1917-2014 In 1936, despite record high temperatures and fierce competition, 19-year-old Louis Zamperini was the youngest American to qualify for the 5,000-meter race in the Summer Olympics. After the Olympics, Lewis attended college and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force. In 1943, while on a search and rescue mission near Oahu, Japan, Lewis's plane malfunctioned and crashed into the ocean. After floating adrift for 47 days, Lewis was captured and taken to four different Japanese prisoner of war camps where guards tormented and tortured him daily and with increasing intensity until the war ended in 1945. Finally liberated, Lewis returned home with severe PTSD. He battled violent nightmares, depression, and alcoholism until his wife convinced him to attend a local Billy Graham crusade. There, God's word saturated Lewis's soul, and he received salvation. Kathy Etheridge, in her book After Unbroken, Billy Graham and Lewis Zamperini, she quoted Zamperini by saying, "...of all my near-death experiences, my life never passed before my eyes." But when Billy Graham quoted scripture, my life did pass before my eyes. Lewis's new zeal for the Lord compelled him to return to Japan to share the gospel with military troops who were serving sentences for war crimes, including those that he once hated. He continued to share his faith worldwide, leading many to Christ through his testimony, autobiography, and the 2014 film Unbroken, until he died in 2014. Nikki Cruz, born in 1938 and, as of this reading, still alive. Nikki Cruz suffered daily beatings and mental abuse from his witchcraft-practicing parents from the time he was old enough to walk and talk. He and his 18 siblings grew up in Puerto Rico, where the violence and bloodshed were so traumatizing that Nikki attempted suicide at age nine. Nikki's father sent him to live with an older brother in New York City six years later. By age 16, Nikki, full of bitterness and rage, was living on the streets of Brooklyn as a member of the Mau Maus, a notorious street gang. I might be mispronouncing that, and if so, I'm sorry. His violent reputation grew quickly, and soon he became the gang's warlord. He ruled the gang with an iron fist until his best friend and fellow gang member was brutally stabbed and died in Nikki's arms. Haunted by nightmares, 
Nikki became reckless. After countless arrests, a court-ordered psychiatrist labeled him a hopeless case destined for prison, the electric chair, and hell. But God had other plans. God broke through the walls surrounding Nikki's hardened heart through the relentless love of a preacher named David Wilkerson. Nikki received salvation and a spiritual heart transplant. His miraculous transformation astounded the authorities, the gangs, and everyone who knew him. Since then, he has spent his whole life in ministry. The Nikki Cruz Outreach said, quote, For the past 50-plus years, Nikki Cruz has traveled the world, speaking to nearly 50 million people in person. For decades, this author of 17 books has been driven to reach an at-risk youth culture being decimated by crime, drugs, and gang activity. Unquote. Then there's Johnny Erickson Tata. She was born in 1949 and is still with us as of this reading. When 17 years old, Johnny Erickson Tata severed her spinal cord in a diving accident that left her permanently paralyzed from the shoulders down. She felt abandoned and rejected by God when that happened. Johnny couldn't imagine ever being able to live a normal life again. And, well, she was right. Last year marked the 55th anniversary of her accident, and her life has been anything but normal. During the long, grueling years of physical and occupational therapy that followed her accident, God performed a transformative work in Johnny's broken spirit to prepare her for an extraordinary future. A few years after her accident, Johnny was catapulted onto the national stage when her best-selling biography, Johnny, was made into a movie. Shortly after, she became an internationally renowned advocate for people with disabilities and the founder and CEO of Johnny & Friends. This Christ-centered ministry helped special needs families worldwide. She's written over 50 books and millions listen to her daily radio program on over a thousand broadcast outlets. Johnny and her husband, Ken Tata, have traveled to 50 countries to provide hope and practical help to those affected by disability. And it's not in the article, but Johnny Erickson Tata is also a very talented artist, using nothing but her teeth to guide the paintbrush or pencil or whatever medium she's using. We actually have one of her pieces here at Marlar House, and she's just amazing. According to God's Power in Weakness, a message from Johnny Erickson Tata, quote, Johnny has received so many prestigious awards and honorary degrees for her faithful service that they can't possibly be described in one article. But she recognizes that none of her achievements would have been possible had God not used her brokenness as a platform to display his power. Unquote. And then there's the late, great Keith Green, who lived from 1953 to 1982. Keith Gordon Green was a musical prodigy and the first 11-year-old to ever sign a recording contract with a major label. Decca Records aggressively promoted the handsome young man as America's next teen heartthrob. But when Keith reached his early teen years, Donny Osmond, a new superstar, entered the music scene and stole the limelight. Devastated by his shattered dream, Keith ran away from home at the age of 15 and became a part of the hippie community. After his experimentation with free love, Eastern mysticism, and psychedelic drugs left him empty, he began exploring religion as a cure for his misery. While performing in nightclubs, Keith met a woman named Melody Steiner, who would soon become his wife, and a man named Randy Stonehill, who convinced them both to attend a home Bible study. God revealed himself to Keith during that meeting and transformed the disillusioned young man into a new creation in Christ. Keith's new gospel-centric songs, which focused on the need for repentance and brokenness, captured the hearts of hungry souls and soon earned him multiple recording contracts. Still, he eventually gave his music away for free. After Keith and Melody married, they opened their home and dedicated their lives to sharing the gospel and everything they owned to help the needy find salvation, hope, and healing. Keith died in a tragic plane crash in 1982, but God continues to use his songs and testimony to provoke others to sell out more completely for Jesus. According to Last Days Ministries, quote, Although Keith is now with Jesus, his life and ministry is still making a huge impact around the world. His songs and passionate delivery are still changing lives. His writings are translated into many languages. Keith once said, When I die, I just want to be remembered as a Christian. It's safe to say he reached his goal, and perhaps a bit more. Unquote. 
This message came from an article written by Annette Marie Griffin, and I did place a link to the article in the episode description. I really enjoyed sharing this with you, and I just want you to know, if your life is miserable right now, if you're dealing with trials and tribulations, if you feel that your past somehow keeps you from doing anything good for God, I hope these seven people give you a little bit of inspiration and a little bit of comfort and freedom to know that, yes, God can use you and will use you. All you have to do is open up and ask Him to do so. If you enjoyed today's message or if you like the Church of the Undead in general, please tell others about us who you think might also want to join in. You can find links to the podcast, YouTube channel, Facebook page, and more at WeirdDarkness.com slash church. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash church. Thanks for joining me, weirdos, and until next time, Jesus loves you and so do I. God bless.